Come on, little YouTube. There we go. I think it worked. We should, in theory, be live. <laughs> I'm not late. I'm, I arrive precisely when I intend to. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Open Space. Uh, I'm here with uh, Dr. Phil Metzger, who uh, Phil and I have talked many times on Twitter, but we've never actually hung out and, and chatted in person. But I think you guys are really going to enjoy what he has to say. So, so uh, Phil, who, who are you? What do you do? Um, well, I'm a planetary scientist. I'm at the University of Central Florida. I was with NASA for about 30 years. I worked on the space shuttle, and then I worked on the space station, and then I co-founded a laboratory which grew into the Swamp Works at the Kennedy Space Center, doing mining and manufacturing, um, utilization of space resources. Now, as a planetary scientist at the, with the faculty at UCF, I'm continuing to do technology development in those areas. And I mean, your name just keeps coming coming up. You recently joined, I think there was like a lunar uh, science uh, group that's considering some of the um, some of the science that's being done on the moon as NASA returns with the Artemis program. You've been investigating ways to harvest resources out of lunar regolith. You have worked on a steam powered rocket for space. And I'm sure that's just a fraction of the, of the projects that you've been, you've been working on. So, um, what, what, like what project, you know, before you went home, what were you working on? Um, <laughs> Well, let's see. Right now, with the Artemis program, NASA getting ready to return humans to the moon, um, I'm most of my research is focused on how rocket exhaust blows soil. Uh, when I was at NASA, I spent about 20 years studying that topic, and um, I've done a lot of research, a lot of modeling, a lot of theory development, analyzing data from the Apollo missions. And so suddenly it's become a big issue again. We're, we're worried about sand blasting spacecraft that are orbiting the moon because a low gravity airless body like the moon doesn't hold dust down if you blow it with rocket exhaust. You can blow it completely off the moon and sand blast things in orbit. So we want to scale that. We want to figure out what, what is the environmental spec going to be in the vicinity of the moon when you're landing really big rockets. Uh, that's crazy. I literally never even thought of that. And you've spent 20 years trying to get to the bottom of this. It's um, and so, OK, so so I'll bite um, if you've got like a really big rocket, you've got a blue moon setting down on the surface of the moon. What kind of altitude is the dust going to reach as it's setting down or a, or a starship? Good question. Um, I can't tell you uh, for any specific lander, but I, I usually do the research in terms of the mass of the lander. The lunar module was a five ton lander. And as a benchmark, I've been doing a lot of work with 40 ton landers. There, right. there was some talk about having 40 ton landers as part of the Artemis program. Um, although there, there's no, I want to just, you know, caveat this, there's no decision made yet right. on the mass of the lander, but um, for a 40 ton lander, it looks to me, um, I, you know, it's funny, I was just doing this calculation about two hours ago. Um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to look at my answer. Yeah. I literally just calculated that. Um, somewhere in here, I'm, I'm scrolling through my Mathematica file which is about two miles long and somewhere right in about here. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, 45 meters above the surface is where a 40 ton lander will start blowing soil. Okay. So as it's, as it is coming down, it'll start to blow soil, but what altitude will the soil reach? Oh, oh, oh I misunderstood the question. Oh, yeah. That's an easier question. Yeah, yeah. 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 So the answer is the ejecta goes to infinity and beyond. Oh, so it's uh, right. So it's on it's on an escape trajectory. Yeah. Well, it won't escape solar orbit, of course, but it will. Um, the the I'll say uh, you're burning hydrogen and oxygen on your lander. Uh, the exit velocity of the gas out of your rocket engine is about four point five kilometers per second. Right. Escape velocity on the moon is about two point three eight kilometers per second. So you're getting towards double escape velocity. And the finest dust will get all the way up to the speed of the rocket exhaust. 
And so there is a certain fraction, I think it's about 10 microns and finer particles will be blown completely off the moon um, and still have a significant velocity um, as they leave the moon. So um, you can definitely sandblast stuff that's in orbit around the moon. And then how uh, Broken Symmetry is asking on Twitch, how long would it take for the lunar dust to settle after a craft landing? So, um, yeah, I think it takes about, well, I'm going to guess, I don't remember the exact calculation, but I think it's about, um, okay, wait a minute. Is, I'm remembering the answer now. <laughs> okay, the answer is that there's a, there's a wide variety of velocities. Some of the particles are going to go above escape velocity. Some are going to go just below escape velocity and uh, you know it depends on the size of the particle it depends on where it was lifted during the landing and so uh the closer it is to escape velocity but just below escape velocity then the higher the elliptical orbit it's going to follow and then but it'll come back and intersect the surface of the moon again right and right. So some of these particles are going to take a week or more before they come back and hit the moon um, so they will continue to rain in on the moon for a very long time. Um, but the flux of these long path particles is very low. And, you know, the solar system is full of dust anyways. You're, the moon is constantly being bombarded by dust coming in at or above lunar escape velocity. So um, the, the question isn't, um, can you stop? the dust, you know, there's no point in stopping it because there's always dust coming in at a high velocity. The question is, can we get it below an acceptable level right. that our hardware will not be degraded to reduce its useful lifetime below some benchmark? Right, right. So, I mean, there, it's, it's all about, it's, ultimately, it's a matter of systems engineering to make sure the spacecraft is going to meet its performance requirements. And, and that, I mean, that dust, that lunar regolith is trouble on so many levels. So can we talk just a bit about what kind of potential health issues the, the astronauts might be facing as they're trying to work in an environment with this stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. The Apollo astronauts remarked, I, I can't forget exact, I mean, I can't remember exactly who, probably Jack Schmidt and others said that the dust is the biggest challenge to exploring the moon. Uh, but I also want to quote Jack that um, the dust is a solvable problem and we're going to solve it through a multi-tiered or a multi-layered engineering approach. There's no one solution. But um, so the, the problem is that we are organisms that are adapted to planet Earth and planet Earth has a lot of water. It has rain, it has rivers and lakes and that water is constantly washing dust out of the environment. Um, we've got weathering processes that crack soil into finer particles, but whenever those fine particles hit a raindrop, they get captured in the water and then right. they follow the path downhill and eventually they get to a slow river where they settle out of the water and it forms the mud at the bottom of the slow moving water. And over geological timescales, when the water moves, the, the rivers move or the land rises and it dries out, it becomes mudstone. It gets baked and squeezed. And eventually through metamorphism, it becomes shale or any, you know, it becomes um, some other kind of rock. And so it's recycled in the rock cycle here on the earth. Well, the moon lacks the hydrology it, and it lacks the the processes in the crust that are constantly recycling the rock. So on the moon, there's a continuous accumulation of fine dust. And it depends what you want to define as dust. If you say about 10 microns and finer, then the bulk regolith in the top few meters is about 10% by mass hazardous dust. You know, it doesn't, you can dig down a, a meter under the surface and grab a handful of that stuff and 10% of the weight of that material is hazardous material. Wow. Because it's fine dust. When you go back into your breathe into your spacecraft and refill it with air and take off your spacesuit, that stuff can get can get levitated and it can follow the the airflow down through your sinuses, through your um, bronchial tubes, all the way into the very bottoms of your lung. The, the finest particles, 10 microns and smaller, are the ones that have low enough inertia that they don't get filtered out by your breathing system. 
And so they'll get all the way into the bottom of your lungs where they'll get embedded oh. and there's no mechanism in your body to ever remove it out of the bottoms of your lungs. Right. It's, it's like asbestos. Yeah. They're too big for the blood to take them out and they're too small. Um, they're so small that they're able to get in in the first place. So um, that's the problem. We, our bodies are not adapted to a, a planet like the moon. And so therefore um, we're going to have to do engineering approaches to solve this to augment our biology, to keep the dust out of our lungs. And um, it's going to have, it's going to be a whole, whole suite of technologies to deal with that. Well, and, and I'm going to want to get into that in, in a second, you know, again, uh, we're going to go down this, uh, this regolith rabbit hole as far as it goes. But um, I know that the Chinese recently reported that their, their Changalander um, was on tens of meters, right? Hundreds of meters of regolith. So it's not like you just go out with a broom, sweep up a little bit and, and you've reduced the risk. You're looking at a tremendously deep amount of material that, yeah, that yeah. you're going to have to process. Yes, that's correct. And now it does the, the material, as you dig down, it does generally get coarser and coarser in particle size. Um, but we're talking about a few meters down um, before you can start to see a large statistical change in the particle size distribution. Um, when you dig down 40 meters, it's probably a lot coarser, a lot less hazardous dust at that depth. Right. The reason why is because the moon is constantly being bombarded and there's no, um, there's no uh, plate tectonics and plate subduction to recycle the, the surface material. And so it just gets broken up and flipped over and flipped over constantly by this bombardment process. Um, but the big impactors that dig deep and flip over the deep stuff are relatively rare. The smaller ones that flip over the shallower and shallower layers become increasingly common. Right. And so therefore, this process of making it finer and finer is amplified the shallower you go. So... Um, the, the top few meters are about 10% dust. Right. Um, I don't know when you go 20 meters down. I don't know what the, I haven't looked at we, those. We numbers. should find out. I mean, clearly we need to go and we need to dig. We need to take core samples. I mean, that's going to be one of the, one of the missions. So, yeah. so let's talk about mitigation then. What are some of the strategies that you guys have been thinking about to try to, to have like say a permanent lunar, research facility and not have everybody be endangered by this dust. Yeah. So um, I, I think I give a good answer on that because the last thing I did at NASA before I left NASA and went to the faculty at the University of Central Florida, um, I participated on the road mapping team to develop NASA's 2014 roadmap. And I was assigned the job of reviewing all the dust mitigation technologies. I had to call up all the researchers and get a status on that technology and write the entire roadmap for dust mitigation. So, so um, it's been a few years, it's been six years since I did that, but it hasn't evolved, the technologies haven't progressed that much in six years. Okay, so um, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of different ways to remove dust. Um, and then, so you want to remove dust everywhere you can. You want to remove dust as soon as it gets on your hardware. You want to remove your dust the next morning. You want to remove the dust before you come into your habitation module. Um, remove it on the airlock, remove it from the air. You know, at every level, you're going to be removing dust from everything. But you also want to prevent dust from getting on stuff. And you also want to design hardware to just be okay with the dust. So all of those are different approaches and we have to do all of them. So um, one thing we wanna do is develop connectors. So if you wanna connect your Rover to your power supply to recharge the batteries, um, when you disconnect it, you can get dust on the connectors and over time it becomes difficult right. to plug them back together again because of all the dust jamming it up. So we've developed self-cleaning connectors there are a lot of different strategies to make a connector clean itself. So the process of you, you connect them together and pull a latch and that locks them in together, but it also operates mechanisms inside the connector that wipe all the pins down and take dust out. Right. Um, you have gas flow, a little puff of gas that when you disconnect it, it blows the dust out. Another idea is when you 
disconnect the connectors, caps flip over both sides automatically. When you connect them together, the caps on the two sides meet to each other so you don't get dust on the inside of the caps. So making mechanisms that automate all that. Um, there's been a lot of work done by Honeybee Robotics and by other groups on, on these technologies. Um, another thing is uh, removing dust from surfaces. You can use airflow, you can use electrostatics or electrodynamics, you can use mechanical wiping or fluids, liquids, um, you can use magnetics, and all of these different processes have been developed to various degrees. One of the coolest ones is the electrodynamic dust shield developed by Dr. Carlos Calle at NASA. This electrodynamic dust screen is little electrodes that are interleaved in the surface. There's actually like three families of electrodes. And one set will be positive, the next set will be negative, and the next set will, I mean, ne positive, neutral, negative. And then the, the voltages will shift so that the one that was positive will turn neutral, and then it'll turn negative, and then it'll turn neutral, and then it'll turn positive. And it creates this traveling wave of voltages <laughs> across the surface. And all the particles will, will either attract to either a negative or a positive one, and then they'll just walk across the surface and it'll move all the dust. Right. Off. And it happens in the blink of an eye. You turn the system on and boom, the dust is just gone. Wow. Off. And, and, and this is part of the problem, right? Is because this stuff is, is so electrostatic that it's, it sticks to everything, whether you want it mm -hmm. to or not. Yeah, that's true. Um, in the vacuum of space, particles can get charges built up on the surfaces. You can, like on a dust grain, you can have a positively charged patch and over here a negatively charged patch. And that's, that's kind of generally what happens. You'll get a dipole moment, but there could also be a, an overall charge to the particle. As the particles are tumbled around, they, um, they tribocharge. And so the, some of the particles, depending on the mineralogy and depending on the surface coatings, the glass, um, in the in the bombardment of micrometeoroids, you get a lot of vaporization and then uh, glass forming on the surfaces. And this surface physics will cause the different particles to randomly charge a little positive or a little negative. So um, that'll cause them to, to cling to surfaces, but you can also leverage that to then move them back off the surface. Right. Yeah, that's now, really what, fascinating. What's cool about this dust screen is they've developed completely transparent electrodes that you can put in glass in a window and you can't see the electrical wiring inside the window and yet when they turn on the dust screen all the dust will scatter off the glass they've also developed an ink that can be printed on fabrics and it's a um it's an ink that is electrically conductive so you can print the electrodes right onto your shirt and when you turn on the battery, then all the dust jumps off your shirt. Right. Pretty cool. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, now, I mean, in addition to the the dangers of this of this regolith, the regolith is also a huge boon for anyone that's going to be trying to live off the land on the moon. What can you use this stuff for? So um, it's a great question. Um, the in general the regolith is not going to be filled with gold or platinum. <laughs> it's not the kind of thing you're going to want to go mine on the moon and bring back and try to sell it on earth right. for a profit other than, you know, the novelty of having a moon rock. I'd buy but, one. Uh, pardon? I'll buy one. Yeah, I would too. Yeah. I would too. Um, so, uh, but it's, it's great resources for doing stuff in space. So if you want to build stuff in space, and create a business utilizing some aspect of space to benefit people back on the earth, then you can use those resources. You don't have to launch them from the earth. And so the question is, what can you use the lunar materials for building stuff? Um, and basically the answer is you can build anything out of lunar materials. Everything you need to build a complete industrial supply chain is accessible in the surface of the moon. Um, the, the, the minerals on the moon uh, can provide iron, aluminum, magnesium, calcium, silicon, um, and a lot of other trace elements. Um, you can go to the poles of the moon where there's ice, and then you can get hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and other trace elements. And um, with, some, with some industrial engineering, you can design well, we've already been working on processes to extract the elements 
to do the chemistry mm -hmm. and then to do materials processing to make materials and then do manufacturing so you can make anything on the moon um and i mean i guess the the, the key is going to be us developing the the actual techniques and so that's the next step that i want to talk to you about i mean your Twitter feed and and such are filled with all kinds of cool uh, rovers and and crawlers and things you know in um, mining equipment uh, in simulated lunar environments. So, what do you think will be the actual hardware that will do this kind of thing? To uh, well, that's a subject of a lot of debate. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of technologists who are working on methods of mining and manufacturing in space, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of ideas out there about how to do it. If you want to mine the regolith on the surface of the moon, all you need is a load haul dump robot. Just go out, scoop it up, and take it away to your chemical processor and dump it in. Um, one of the beautiful things about, about mining on the moon is that the moon is an airless body, and so it has a lot of bombardment going on, and so all the materials are already broken up. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of energy busting rock on the moon. Mm. Nature already did it for you. Um, another thing I failed to mention a minute ago when you ask what resources are there, the lunar soil does contain metal. It contains metal that's already in reduced form. It's already pure metal. Um, there are grains at about one weight percent or a half a weight percent, depending on where you go. It's not a lot, but they're scattered in the lunar regolith. They can be pulled out with a magnet. And um, it's iron primarily. Um, it's not gold or platinum, but it's metal that you can use to make stuff. And so by processing, by beneficiating the soil, running it through a process where you're using magnetics and other and other processes, you can sort the grains and pull the metal out of the lunar soil and then use it to manufacture. So you can build trusses, you can build um, habitats. Um, and, uh, and then from what I understand, I, you know, and this is maybe Andy Weir is getting into my head now, but he was saying that uh, that as you process the the lunar regolith, the byproduct is oxygen. So you're you're able to essentially have almost too much oxygen. Yeah, for, yeah, that actually what you is would need. the problem. That I've, a lot of people have wondered, what do you do with all the oxygen? So what Andy was talking, and I've talked with Andy on two occasions about his technology, and because um, I wanted to see if he, he, if he had a legitimate technology in his re most recent book, and he does. Um, I, I quizzed him pretty detailed about how do you extract the aluminum? How do you sort the aluminum from the iron because in you know iron's a good solvent and the aluminum will dissolve into the iron so how do you get them separated and so he had actually spent a lot of effort trying to get that technology right um but the the thing is you're, so what you're talking about is um it's not you're not talking about getting the grains that are already free metal what you're talking about is getting the mineral the um the basalt mineral or the the ilmenite and doing a chemical process to remove the oxygen to make metal. Hmm. There are about 50 different chemical processes that people have proposed to do this. Some of them have been developed to a degree. For example, you could use fluorine as a working chemical to extract the, the metal from the oxides in the mineral. Um, or you could use, um, you could use a caustic agent, or you could use an ionic liquid, an, an, a salt, hmm. uh, a designer salt to dissolve the regolith and then perform additional chemistry to sort the different elements from each other. So, uh, but so you get a loop that if you do that, you get iron, you get aluminum, you get magnesium, and you get a host of other things, um, and you get a huge amount of oxygen. The moon is about 42% oxygen by, by mass. <laughs> so the entire moon is one big gigantic ore body of oxygen um, in concentrated form. There's this big ball of oxygen in the sky right there. You can see it every night. Yeah. And by the way, the, the biggest cost of space flight is launching oxygen off the earth. So the, the easiest, the, the low hanging fruit in space resources is to get oxygen out of the moon. Stop launching oxygen, make oxygen, 
and then um, just bring the fuel from the earth. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be an easy first step that we could do. Um, so that's why that's why there are so many methods that have been conceived of for getting oxygen out of the soil and making metal. Now, have you spent a lot of time thinking about other places in the solar system and how they relate to resource acquisition on on the moon? I mean, there's Mars, there's asteroids. Mm -hmm. What are some other places that you think are, are going to be very useful for, for our future in space? Yeah, so great question. Um, it's very speculative because, you know, we can't really predict what's going to happen next week. <laughs> so we're, talking, you know, we're talking now about 50 to 100 years in the future. You know, I think my personal opinion is that we should start on the moon and use asteroids to start a, a um, cis lunar economy mm -hmm. to um, perfect the techniques, perfect the technologies, and then we can export those techniques to further out in the solar system, export them to the surface of Mars, right. to support settlement on Mars. Um, but to answer your question, um, in my speculative thinking, the next place is the main asteroid belt. Um, the volatiles on the moon are a limited resource. There's a lot of right. volatiles on the moon. I mean, a huge amount of volatiles on the moon. If you, um, according to one estimate, Paul Spudis' uh, estimate, if you mined the moon for water to make rocket fuel, you could launch the space shuttle once a day for a thousand years using the water on the moon. Um, but if we are successful as a species in taking civilization to the next level, um, like, for example, think about ancient Sumeria. You know, they had their cuneiform tablets and they and they've made they grew wheat or something, barley or something. And um, and they went around fighting wars over territory. You know, that was the, the level of their civilization. You know, it's a much more awesome experience we have in civilization today because we are processing energy and resources using machinery. Um, it's harming the planet, and so we got to get those machines off the planet. Right. But once we do, there's no reason that we have to stay at this level anymore because the solar system could su literally could support a billion times greater activity in civilization. Now, I don't think we would want to go a billion times bigger because then you're going to harm the whole solar system. <laughs> yeah. But you could easily go a few million times more vibrant in our civilization without harming the solar system. Right. And um, and so what would what could civilization be like? Yeah. If you've got a, a, a trillion people years. living in the solar system. Yeah. Or, but e even even not necessarily the, the population of the people, but just the if you had an industrial supply chain that could could process a, a million times more energy and a million times different industrial processes making things, the 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 outcome is not even conceivable today. Like mm -hmm. if you if you sent the blueprint for all the machines on earth today back in time to the smartest people who lived 200 years ago, it would be completely useless to them because they wouldn't be able to do any of it. Um, to make a CAT scan machine, you've got to have the full supply chain of planet earth to make all the machines, that make all right. the parts, that make all the materials, all the mining, the whole supply chain is required to make a CAT scan machine. And so you cannot have this level of civilization without this level of supply chain. But if you had a million times greater industrial activity out there where it doesn't hurt the planet, yeah. the, it's inconceivable right. what we could be doing, the, the types of things we could be doing in science and engineering and technology. Yeah. So, um, so anyways, I think the next step beyond the cislunar economy, yeah, settle Mars. I mean, there are a lot of people that would love to settle Mars. I'm not really a Mars person. So I think the, the asteroid belt is the next place because that's where you can start to really scale up industry, start to own the solar system, start to make it a safer place mm -hmm. for all species to live, and at the same time, create a much more vibrant civilization, um, and, then, and then begin to reach out to the stars. Yeah, I mean, that's a, I mean, reaching out to the stars is a whole other scale of, of, of operation. Um, uh, the, 
But when you sort of think about the constant growth that humanity has seen over history, whatever, you know, on average, say 2% per year for 10,000 years, and you just chart that number into the future, even though a million times more energy mm -hmm. capability, manufacturing capability just sounds like a ludicrous number, you can literally, you can estimate it down to the day of when we will be there based on historical growth trends. That's how, as we're all learning, exponential growth works. And it's not I long. I to say, I think you're, right? you're creating a backdoor to talk about the epidemic. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, not necessarily. No, 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 I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little, a little that's sick. that's exactly the same math. You're exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, 2%, I mean, well, there's a, I have a friend, Martin Elvis, he's with the Harvard Smithsonian Institute. Um, and uh, he's an astrophysicist, and he says that um, asteroid mining is his day job. Um, his night job is being an astronomer. So, um, so anyways, he uh, he recently published a paper with um, with one or two co-authors, and I and I apologize to his co-authors. I don't remember their names, but they did that calculation. They calculated how soon until civilization begins to damage the overall solar system. Yeah. And it's really not that far in no, the future. No, no, it's like I can't remember the number, but couple, it's like it was like a couple of thousand years. years. Well, not less than that. It yeah. was like a, maybe a, a couple hundred. Yeah, it right. Crazy That's right. Short. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so they were saying, let's get ahead of the game this time. Let's let's be smart this time. Let's set aside, you know, eighty percent of space is national park or yep. international park, you know. Um, they got a lot of blowback. A lot of people are like, oh, that's crazy. Why did you ever think about that? But I totally agree with them that um, it's not that far in the future and you're not going to fix the problem unless you get out of it right yeah. now. And and so I think that we, you know, here we are here on Earth. We are, I think a lot of people are super frustrated by the lack of progress why haven't we gone back to the moon? Why haven't we gone back to the moon? You know, it's been whatever, 50 years since since human beings have, have walked on the moon. But the technology for achieving and accomplishing th that future of becoming a spacefaring civilization is has not only been progressing, but it really feels like it's been inevitable that 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 is just the that is what comes with a continuing accelerating growth curve that that the place where we are right now this tipping point being where we are overusing the resources of planet earth this was inevitable and the only place to go next is to space and the only way to go to space is to is to perfect those technologies yeah i agree that there 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 feels it feels like there's something inevitable about it um, however, I don't rationally believe it's inevitable because there's another possible outcome, which would be extinction. Sure. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I think that uh, in general, though, information begets information and technology that processes information is uh, developed because of the information it processes that if you take that sentence and write it as a math equation, it's a differential equation, which is the first one that anybody learns to solve. And it's the exponential function yep. that predicts exponential growth. And that's the origin of Moore's law, for example, that um, transistor density is doubling every 18 months. It's, it's one piece of information technology riding along in the overall exponential growth of civilization. The way I like to look at it is that um, information has, it's like DNA. It's, it's, um, it's embedded inside an organism and the organism is the, the container of the DNA, um, but the, the DNA can leap from container to container, you know, like this virus that right now we're dealing with. Um, we, sections of our own DNA are actually placed there um, they, they were inserted into our DNA by viruses. And you can actually look in the, you know, maybe the junk DNA and see these segments where uh, somewhere back in the past, we had some DNA inserted in us. Um, so in the same way, I think that um, information was once purely biological. Eventually humans 
it, the information began to leap th that container. And so humans began to develop methods of uh, passing information to each other using written language, spoken language, then written language. Then we develop mathematics. Eventually we develop machines that process information. And so the, the, the overall container of, of information is civilization. Civilization is growing because, because of the way we've containerized information and we rely on it we, and we replicate information. Uh, and as a result of the growth of civilization, we're now hurting the planet. Mm -hmm. the natural solution is to unleash the information from the planet. So that civilization and information systems can continue to grow and create this amazingly cool future without harming this place where the biology yeah. needs to continue existing. Yeah, I mean, it's the planet Earth uh, is the only place in the universe that we know that has life on it. And and yet we're using it for all of these these other purposes. And what if we could just let the Earth as as one tiny fraction of the available real estate in the entire solar system, the available resources, what if we um, just let it be a, a, an Eden, right? What if we made it just a perfect place for life to flourish? And anyone who wants to live in this flourishing life can, but, you know, there's no need for factories. There's no need for 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 farming. There's no need for any of that, right? It all just comes from space. And, yeah. And now it is and... challenging to figure out how to how to do that. How do you get the machines off the planet and yet still have them support people and civilization on the planet? Yeah. Um, it's challenging to see how that can be done if you're trying to imagine it at our current level of right. civilization, right? But once you've imagined what it's going to be like to unleash the machines from our planet. And I don't mean turn them into killing machines. <laughs> right. you know, I'm talking about Terminator. I Berserkers, mean, move yeah. the supply chain. Once we move the supply chain outside our planet and scale it up, then it actually becomes kind of easy to do to to do these things to benefit the planet while while um, still growing civilization larger. Yeah, I've got a bunch of questions uh, from the audience, and I would love to throw some of these your way. Alistair Brook wants to know what about Venus. I mean, I always just say that we should just push Venus into the sun. <laughs> but if you've got a better idea, I'm, I'm open. Okay, yeah. Um, so I've got this thing hanging on my wall called the Space Plan. And I have three versions of it. The original version, I think, was, was made in 1989, right around then, by some engineers at Boeing. And um, it's the most audacious, crazy thing you've ever seen. It's a black and white a spaghetti drawing of blocks, a block diagram with lines everywhere. It's so dense. You have to use a microscope to, to understand it. And it starts at the top with space shuttle, you know, testing EVA suits. And at the bottom, it's got traversing world ships, you know, entire <laughs> countries of people going to other, other stars, you know, and it's the whole plan. And there's this one section in that plan where it talks about Venus. And, and I don't know anybody who was involved in developing the space plan. Um, so we're, we're all doing this like archeological study to try to unearth what it meant. Where do I see this? This is incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's actually, uh, you can find a PDF of it. Really, and, I'm Google yeah. that right now. There's a group that has updated it twice. Um, so there's modern versions, but if you want to see the, the crazy audacious with the Venus stuff, get the black and white original version. Now in that section, there's this thing called begin rotation program. And, and everybody's like, what is the rotation program for Venus? And by golly, I think they're talking about spinning up the planet to make the days and nights faster. Right. I don't know how they thought they would ever spin Venus up to go faster. Nobody that I know has ever figured that out yet. But um, they do talk about seeding the atmosphere with bacteria, to try to transform the chemistry to get rid of this crazy greenhouse effect so that Venus can cool down. Um, there's some other things like that. They talk about moving some asteroids to make a moon for Venus. Yeah. I think that can become the basis of a... Um, of a space elevator or something like that. It's really crazy audacious and a lot of fun. Um, now, uh, a little bit more practical than that, 
There's a scientist at NASA Glenn Research Center named Jeff Landis. Yeah. Jeff proposed doing, um, I think he may have been one of the first, if not the first, to propose doing a cloud city in Venus. I love the fact that his name is Landis because in Star Wars, it was Landau who yeah. was at the cloud city. Um, so uh, the, the nice thing about the Venus, the stratosphere of Venus is that the temperature and pressure are about the same as the surface of the earth, the troposphere of earth. And so you could have a shirt sleeve environment when, you know, maybe the, the acidity of the atmosphere would be a problem, but you don't need pressure suits. You just need a mask for oxygen. And so you could have a, a fairly benign environment floating in the stratosphere of Venus. Um, and Venus being the twin of earth is an incredibly important place to do planetary science to try to understand the formation of the earth and the, the evolution of our solar system. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking because you've got the, this world that is essentially the same mass as earth. It's, it's the only place that probably has, the, you know, it's roughly the same gravity if you're down on the surface. And so it's like the only other place that would be pretty habitable if it wasn't a hellscape right but who knows right who knows what those that future million times production capacity future civilization will be able to do with uh, with a place like venus at some point they're going to go yeah let's clean that up let's fix that and then whatever they come up with you know putting a giant um sun shade at the l1 sun venus lagrange point and and stripping away or locking away all that uh that atmosphere. But, and again, it's sort of the kinds of things that as we think right now are utterly ludicrous, and yet they're almost inevitable when you consider exponential growth curves. So let me get another uh, question. All right. So Dragon King asks, when will we walk on Mars? So place your bets. Okay. Um, yeah, like I, like I said a minute ago, I'm not really um, the Mars guy. Um, so I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about Mars. Um, I think Mars will be a consumer of space industry rather than a major participant. But um, there are a lot of people that want to live on Mars. And so I think it'll be an important consumer and therefore it'll be an important part of our future. Um, I'm just not one of the people working on that. So, I, um, but I would guess, I would guess, um, it will probably not be a, um, a government funded program to get humans to Mars because it will be rather expensive. Mm -hmm. um, government space agencies uh, necessarily are risk averse. They have to be because of the nature of politics and geopolitics. And, and so they really shouldn't criticize for that. That's the way it has to be. Mm -hmm. um, but other groups, that uh, like like Elon and SpaceX, um, they are able to be less risk averse and do things in a more uh, affordable way. And um, so I think it's probably going to be um, a private company that gets humans to Mars first. And I think they could actually do it fairly soon. I think that um, I mean this is it would almost be crazy to say in the 2030s but um but honestly i think it could be done in the 2030s yeah. i mean i think that that there are a lot of people who who feel that there is some kind of economy to be had in in being able to do mars or you know helium mining on the moon but but the you know the the investigation that I've done is that it is all going to gobble up all your money for decades, possibly you know a hundred years until we finally cross some some tipping point that makes it an economical venture. I mean, we see the difficulty that all of these space based resource companies have had uh, in just staying alive because it's it's not a profit center, it's a cost. Yeah, I have friends who will say, hey, uh, these people think they're going to make money in space. They're not going to make money. You only lose money in space. You only spend yeah. money in space. Yeah. Um, I, I don't agree with that um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I have spent decades trying to solve exactly that question. 
And when I was at NASA, I, I got to talk to all the space companies. And, and so I used to keep a list of how do you, first my list was how do you make money in space? And then I realized that was too narrowly defined because the real goal is not necessarily to make money. The real goal is to motivate investment. And you can do that through philanthropy and through a wide variety of mechanisms um, in addition to the profit motive. So originally I thought there it's only, I used to say this, there's only eight ways to make money in space, eight categories. Um, but people would always say, no, you forgot this. And I would say, but that's dumb. And they would argue and I'd be, okay, I'll add it to the list. And so I'm up to like 48 things on the list. Right? <laughs> there's only and, 48 um, ways to make money. <laughs> well, to motivate investment in space, but some of them are truly crazy. Some like I have a, I had a friend, he's deceased now, but he used to say the, the big business case for the moon is to put a nursing home on the moon because in low gravity, it's better for your elderly bones. And I used to think that is the craziest thing because when you're elderly, you don't want to be on the moon when your grandkids are on the earth, you know, like who's going to want to be that far away from their grandkids. But, um, but it's on the list, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but, uh, but there are some real, really good ideas on the list and I've got my own and I'm not going to tell my idea because we're actually trying to work it. Um, so we have a team of people and, and we've got our idea that we're trying to work. And I know other people have their ideas that they're trying to work. Um, but at the University of Central Florida, we have a team put together um, trying to implement an idea that I think is the way that we're going to pay to to put industry in space. Um, a lot of people have focused on the idea of the water economy, and I, I totally agree that the water economy is probably going to be the first resource that we use for off-planet mm -hmm. industry. Um, you can make rocket fuel, and I've run the, the economic numbers on this, and I think the business case does close. I think that you can mine water on the moon and make rocket fuel and use it to boost communication satellites into higher orbits, you know, throw them into geostationary transfer orbit or low Earth orbit from a launcher, um, but save the mass of your upper stage, use a refuelable space tug instead, and the space tug can get it to its final orbit within a couple of days, rather than waiting six to 12 months for an electric thruster to get it to its final orbit. Yeah. You can recoup the lost revenues of six to 12 months from your spacecraft. Um, and, um, and those are uh, on the order of $100 million. So if you can deliver spacecraft to their final orbit for like $50 million, then you've got 50 million of profit to split among all parties. And the, my calculations say that that's very doable. Right. Um, but the, the issue is the, the risk, de-risking it and developing and maturing the technologies so that investors can see that they're going to get their money back within a short amount of time. Um, so that's where we are right now on, on the water economy. Yeah. And I mean, I know that that some of like United Launch Alliance, I think at some point has said, we'll pay. If you can get us fuel in space, we'll pay because mm -hmm. we need to be able to refuel our, our upper stages. So is that, I mean, is that... I've always really advocated that that's the main role that NASA really needs to play is to, to de-risk these challenges, to find every place that that commercial enterprise is nervous to to work on spaceflight. And, bec and 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 the reason is because they have these these risks that they're that that they don't know what's on the other side of that and to try and de-risk it. But but they have you know, I guess no one's put me in charge of NASA yet, um, but but it is interesting to me. You know, they 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 continuously cross that line between we're a shipping company, we're a scientific research center, we make airplanes. What role do you think that NASA has in in helping and assisting this process? Yeah. So ultimately, the legislative branch here in the United States is the branch that defines the role for the agencies. And so NASA 
is only allowed to do what it's authorized by Congress to do. Um, and so NASA, uh, according to the legislature, is an exploration agency. It's not a space settlement agency, although there's been movement um, in the recent appropriations bills. I think there's been some movement towards giving NASA an enhanced role towards developing space econ the space economy. Um, and that's, that's a very good development. So um, if we could convince the politicians that, that the future of our planet is going to include a vibrant space economy, and if we can convince the politicians that the countries that are participating and leading in that field are going to be the dominant policy setting countries throughout the, the, the majority of this century, then I think Congress, the politicians are going to act and they're going to tell NASA that the most important thing you can do is to do exactly what you said, yeah. lead the, the incubation of technologies, the, the de-risking of economic activity off the earth, become a, the, the anchor customer for economic activity off the earth and to begin uh, helping our country lead in that world. Um, I think we aren't that far away from, from finally convincing the politicians. Um, I think that there's eventually going to be a phase change where, yeah. where one day, you know, they're all frozen. And then over a period of about a couple of years, suddenly they're all melted, you know, and, and every, it's just suddenly going to happen. The temperature gets to the right point yep. and then it happens. Yeah, um, there's there's some interesting movement in that direction. Like I know that um, that NASA signed a deal with SpaceX to essentially teach them everything they know about transferring fuel and refueling rockets in in space, because of course, the Starship is going to need to be able to refuel itself with with multiple launches and, and SpaceX has no experience in actually being able to do this. And NASA has tons of experience in, in doing this. And so they're going to provide them with hardware and literally just brain dump everything they know on on how to do that. From NASA's point of view, it's not very much money. And from SpaceX's point of view, it's 10, you know, different intricate pieces of technology that have already been worked out that they can then take and implement and go and go farther. So I think it's a more of that, please, I think is great. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, what I would love to see NASA do is build a propellant depot somewhere between the Earth and the moon, maybe at a Lagrange point, maybe put it in high Earth orbit, you know, geostationary orbit, maybe put it in lunar orbit, low lunar orbit. I, everybody's got their favorite place for propellant depot. Um, but somewhere, anywhere, build a <laughs> propellant depot and then begin, oh, well, NASA's already, already in the early steps of um, helping support, helping develop the water economy by uh, this Viper mission. Yeah. Viper is going to be a rover that goes to one of the poles of the moon. It's going to drive around and drill and it's going to characterize the vertical and lateral variability of the resource, um, which is an absolutely vital first step toward um, figuring out how to extract the resource. If you, you can't really design the extraction systems until you get some idea about, is it gonna be economically profitable or not? Um, and you need to characterize the resource to make that judgment. So uh, NASA is already on the path of helping this uh, get started. Um, so, but I'd love to see more of that. I'd love to see NASA uh, put more money into developing the mining hardware, into the cleanup of the water. You know, the, the ice on the moon isn't just water. It's, it's a little more than half water. The rest of it is carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, um, and a whole raft of other chemicals. So we need to create the system that's going to separate the volatiles and um, remove the, the metals. And because um, there's, we know there's um, mercury, for example, in the ice on the moon. So remove the, uh, the contaminants, uh, which are also resources, and then create the, uh, the systems to uh, electrolyze and then 
chill, liquefy, and store mm -hmm. on the lunar surface or in space um, at the propellant depot so that we can, and then, and then the next step would be begin buying that water, begin planning NASA's space transportation system to make use of that water so that the commercial companies can get cash flow and then they can perfect the system, make it more economically efficient and become profitable. Yeah. Um, and, and once you've got that, once, once you've got a business <laughs> on the moon, right. then you're going to eventually get a flourishing of businesses around it. Because uh, once you can land and take off on the moon and refuel, you're, you have a gas station to refuel, um, then getting back and forth to the moon becomes a lot cheaper. And so other businesses become economically viable after the first one does. Um, and so then there's going to be a flourishing of activity and we'll be on that path to see civilization yeah. grow beyond Earth. Um, Corey S. asks, um, how will normal people be able to afford to pay for those products made in space if there aren't any jobs on the planet? That is a good question. And um, I wrote a paper and I haven't published it yet. I've been sitting on it. Um, but the paper is on that topic. Uh, it's the first question is with the robotics revolution, we're eventually going to put ourselves out of work. Yeah. Uh, we won't, we won't need everybody to do manufacturing jobs, farming, you know, we can go down the list of all the jobs that are going to be automated in the long run. They're all going to be automated. Mm -hmm. You know, we will eventually have computers that can do science better than humans can do. Yeah. Eventually. Yeah. You know, I don't know how far, hundred years, 200 years, but that's coming. Mm -hmm. um, but that's so, always uh, happened. Right. And then, and, and we always just adapt like, like we will have, um, you know, people will have jobs being therapists for artificial intelligence networks right to help them deal with the stress of being an artificial intelligence uh you know yeah. people will people will find there there will be a i mean it will be wrenching in the in the near term as these, these changes happen but we have asked this same question a hundred times as different new technological revolutions have come along and we've always come up with yeah, an answer I I think that um, the future humans are going to have a lot of jobs being interfaces to the computers, to the machines, um, helping each other interface, you know, so you go to buy a product and the, the computers know what you want already, but you can have a human there being the interface, you know, because humans can, you know, we like to interface with other humans. I don't know. But what, where I think, getting to the question that was asked, I think the, the problem a lot of people are addressing this question about the robotics revolution and putting us out of work. What hasn't been addressed is what happens when the robotics revolution is in space, because uh, we can't, as, as ordinary humans, we can't afford to go and work on the moon. Um, you can't buy a ticket on the Mayflower and go live in a log cabin on the moon because the startup cost for your log cabin is vastly higher than it was back on when you were just crossing an ocean on the earth. Um, and so that's a major unsolved problem. And I, and I, I mentioned a minute ago that we're starting a program at the University of Central Florida, and it's actually going to address that. So, and you've got a paper coming. So let me know. Yeah, it's uh, written. Um, yeah. I just don't know when's the right time to publish the paper. Uh, you know, if you've got a little time on your hands, uh, I guarantee universe today will cover your uh, your work so you've, you've got to you know as long you, you just have to tell me and i will assign a writer to the to the job um well phil we're reaching the the end of our hour i uh, but where does the time go it was super fun uh but if people want to follow more and see what you're doing where can they go okay my twitter handle is dr phil till that's d-r-p-h-i-l-t-i-l-l -L. my middle name is tillman yeah so and i've got a link uh, I've got a link in the um, in the show notes for this, and I do highly recommend following uh, Phil on 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 Twitter. You are the master of these great big long tweet storm threads. Have you considered blogging? You know, it's it's like a bunch of tweets. 
yeah, just yeah. in one big document. Anyway, I actually have a blog. Yeah. I have updated it in forever. Yeah. It's philipmetzger.com. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. To me, it's, see, when I do these tweet threads, I'm usually on a bus or somewhere. Yeah. And so I can just, you yeah. know, do a tweet at a the time. They've been absolutely fascinating. I mean, th there's a whole conversation that you had about the inevitability of space based uh, internet. And just how again resources are are jamming up, and we could spend a whole other hour having that conversation. But but we and maybe we'll have to have that again sometime in the future. But but uh, Phil, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I really appreciate it. Super fascinating. Um, I will make sure that people find out more about what you're working on. Uh, thanks everyone for watching us today. Thanks to the moderators for keeping everything in check. Sorry we didn't get to as many of your questions as I wanted to. I needed to hog the time. So um, all right, we'll see you all. Uh, next week we've got, oh man, let me just make sure I remember who we've got next week because you're, you're definitely going to want to join me. Uh, we've got, oh right, Matt O'Dowd from PBS Space Time is going to be my, uh, my, my guest. So we'll talk then. All right. Thanks, Phil. Bye-bye.